Jeremiah chapter number 29, verses number 4 through 7. Jeremiah chapter number 29, verses number 4 through 7. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that they may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its well Welfare will determine your welfare. Uh, I want to take the next few moments and I want to preach to you from this thought. Excel in the exile. Excel in the exile. You may be seated today in the presence of our God. Jeremiah chapter number 29 is a very interesting passage found in our Bible. And if you really have been in church for a long time, then really this is a verse or this is a chapter that you've heard a lot about. Maybe even if this is your first time in church, if you've ever gone to Hobby Lobby, if you've ever gone to any sort of furniture store, you probably have seen some sort of poster or some sort of decoration that holds a part of Jeremiah chapter number 29. Jeremiah chapter number 29, it consists and it holds a great promise found in verse number 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans that are not for harm, but plans that will give you a hope and a future and plans that are good. And that's a great promise because I don't know about you, but we've all been found in a place where we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go next. We don't know what to do next. But friend, if you ever find yourself in a moment like that, be encouraged of what Jeremiah chapter number 29 verse 11 says. Even though you don't have a plan, even though you don't know what's next, be encouraged. God has a plan and his plan is good and his plan isn't going to harm you, it's going to help you and his plan is isn't going to counsel you. It's going to prosper you. His plan will give you a hope and a future. That's what Jeremiah chapter number 29, it holds this great promise found in verse 11 that in whatever season of our life we might find ourselves in, we know that God has a plan. Friend, can I encourage you of something? Even with all these rumors of wars and even with, with, with our country being as divided as it's ever been, God still has a plan. Friend, whatever your life might look like today, whether it's scary, whether it's dark, whether whatever you might be going through, it might seem like it's bigger than you. Be encouraged of something, friend. God has a plan. You don't got to try to work your way out of it. God is great at being a great planner. Can I tell you something about our God? Our God is the greatest planner in the universe. Whatever he plans, it comes to pass. Why? Because our God is a man of his word. He does not lie. So if he put that dream on the inside of you, if he gave you that vision, if he gave you that word, then friend, just stay calm and be encouraged because God will fight your battles. Can somebody give God praise for that today? That our God is fighting our battles and that he has a plan. But Jeremiah 29, as it holds a great promise, I'm, I'm encouraged and I'm fascinated to be able to see that in verses 4 through 7, it gives us instructions. Friend, this is how God works. You know, maybe you've heard it in church, but our God is a God of order. And when he gives a promise, it's, it's very, it's very, um, it's, it's very known that after he gives up or, bo or before he gives a promise, he also gives instructions. 
You see, many love God and they love Christianity and they love the Bible because they think that this book is a book of promises. But friend, that is incorrect. This book is not a book of promises. Although it holds promises and although all those promises are yes and amen, this book is not a book of promises. This book is a book of instructions. What did God tell Joshua? He didn't say, keep this book of promises in your mouth. No, he said, Joshua, keep this book of instructions in your mouth. And if if you follow it, I'll be with you. And if you follow it, I'll bless you. And if you follow it, everywhere you lay your foot, that will be ground which belongs to you. Friend, many love the promises of God, but they never see them come to pass because they don't know how to follow God's instructions. And it's important that you know today that yes, God has a promise over your life that you will be healed, you will be free, you will prosper, you will excel in the exile. But there's also some instructions that God has given us to be able to follow so that we could be able to see the promise of God come to pass. Friend, I don't know if you know this, but there's so many people who never see the promise of God come to pass in their life, not because God's a bad God, but because they don't follow instructions. You know, people think that when it comes to God, it's like reheating food in a microwave. You get food that wasn't finished and you put it in a microwave and you put a couple of minutes and you wait and boom, it's ready to go. But that's not how God works. God is not a microwave God. He doesn't do things with a microwave. If you could ever find any illustration on how God works, it's really like if you're baking a cake. When you bake a cake, you don't just get any sort of flour, but you go to Walmart, you go to H-E-B, you go to whatever your choice of grocery store, and you choose that box of batter, and you take it home, and before you ever do anything with it, you read it. I don't know about you, but I'm not a good cook. I'm not a good baker. So when I get those boxes, you best believe I'm reading everything, every instruction, because I want to make sure that the cake comes out as good as it looks in the picture. And friend, that's the way that it works with God. When God has given you an entire book of instructions, it's not just so you could throw it in a microwave and expect it to work out because you want it to work out. No, look at the instructions. Read the instructions. Follow the instructions. And when you do, baby, you better believe that the promise of God will come to pass. Why? Because his word is true. It's a light that guides. It's a word that cannot be overcome. Come on, yeah, give God a great praise that his word never returns void. But there's so many people that look at this book and the reason they never see the promise of God come to pass, it's because they don't read the instructions or maybe they do, but they don't follow them. Friend, it's me, it means nothing for you to read the instructions and yet not follow them. Well, anybody can read any sort of instructions. Anybody can read Psalms 23. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I know you're with me. Anybody can read that. But friend, when you find yourself in a valley that's dark, when you find yourself in a valley that's lonely, can you apply it and say like David, even in this valley, I'm not alone. My shepherd is with me. His staff comforts me. He leads me to greener pastures. You see, there's instructions. This is a book of instructions, and it's not going to keep you back. Instead, if you follow it, you'll be blessed. Instead, if you follow it, you'll prosper. Instead, if you follow it, you'll live under the open windows of heaven, and you'll see the goodness of God in the land of the living. But so many 
They expect God to work like a microwave. Get food. Get situations in your past that weren't fixed by a counselor or a doctor. And so take what was left over. Throw it in a Sunday service. Worship one song. And boom, after Sunday, it's supposed to be ready. No, friend, that's not how it works. God is a God of order. That when you keep this book of instructions in your mouth, you will prosper. Come on, yeah, give God a good praise for that. And so in Jeremiah chapter number 29, there are, there's a great promise. But before that great promise, there's great instructions. And I believe that whatever your situation might be like today, wherever you might find yourself in life, I came to declare to you prophetically, you will excel in the exile. You know, God is speaking to a people who in Jeremiah chapter number 29, they've been, they've been deported from their homes. If you really read the story, the, these armies of Babylon came and kicked them out of homes that they worked for and kicked them out of places that belonged to them and took them to a place where it was no longer home. It was a foreign land. It was a new land. There was new people in charge. And so these people, I could only imagine how it must have felt seeing your home be, be taken away, seeing the place you grew up with being taken away and now being found in a land where things are not like they used to be. Things don't look like they used to look. And it's in that that God tells Jeremiah, I want you to tell them prophetically with my voice that even in that exile, they will excel. Friend, whatever it might be in your life, it's not going to kill you. You're going to come out of it stronger. You're going to come out of it greater you will live in under the open window of heaven whatever the sickness by, might be it won't steal you away from your destiny whatever the trouble might be it won't come in the way of the plan and purpose of God because whatever God ordains no devil in hell no power in in, in the earth can stop it you will excel in the exile but I want to give you four things today. There's a couple of things in Jeremiah chapter number 29 that God tells these people in exile so that they can excel in that land. But I want to give you four things. Four things that you could do if you ever find yourself in a season where you feel like you're exiled. If you ever find yourself in a season that is dark. If you ever find you're like, like yourself in a season that is lonely. I want to give you four things out of Jeremiah chapter number 29 that you could do that will cause you to excel in the exile. Number one, if you want to excel in the exile, build. The first thing that God told his people is build homes. Oh, isn't it funny? That's the same thing God told Noah when he was about to flood the earth. He said, build a boat. Isn't that funny? It's the same thing God told Gideon when they were about to go to war. He said, go and build an army. Friend, even in this time, God is calling you to build Build that marriage. Build that business. Build those children. Because God is not calling us to stay on the sidelines afraid with our hands in our, in our armpits waiting around for someone else to do something. No. We have the solution. We're the answer to the problem. But build. Oh, it got real quiet up in here. Friend, I know it doesn't make sense. Really, Alex? You're calling me to build that business? Have you seen the economy? Yes, I've seen the economy. Yes, I live under the same economy you do. But I know that the economy is not my source. God is my source. You build that business. Noah was called to build. Even in the moments where the earth was about to be devastated, God didn't tell Noah, hey, bro, just wait around. 
Just wait around until it happens. Just wait until the waters come. He said, no, the waters are coming. But until they come, you build. Friend, the world, it's not getting better. So because it's not getting better, baby, we get her, We better get to building. Build up that dream. Build up that vision. Because maybe you might be discouraged. And you might say, no, no, it's too late. I'm 40. I'm 50. I'm 60. No, I'm not going to do it. Can I tell you the devil is a liar. The time on the clock is not out yet. And like they say, it's not over till it's over. Baby, God's calling us to build. Build homes. Build churches. Build businesses. Build great marriages. I don't know if you know this, but if you're married, you know it's going to take some building to make that marriage work. If you got children, you know it to be true. It's going to take some building to get those children all the way through college. And it's going to take some building to get those children to be better than you. But friend, you might feel weak. You might feel tired. You might have not seen any fruit just yet. But you keep building. Because there will come a time, like Noah's time, that he built that boat. When people looked at him and said, Noah, you're crazy. What are you doing? What are you, it's going to what? God said he's going to do what? Flood the, we haven't even seen rain just yet. What do you mean? Water's going to come from the sky and water's going to come from from the earth and it's going to be 40 days and 40 nights of just rain. First of all, what is rain? When everyone looked at Noah like he was crazy, Noah never stopped building. He kept building. Why? Because he had a word from God that said, Noah, the floods are coming. But until they come, you build. Friend, even during this time, this is not time for you to sit back and let your faith fizzle out. No, this is time to stir up your faith and start that business. Stir up your faith and do that thing that you haven't done for 20 years. But God is calling you to build. Don't stay still. Don't stay silent. Don't stay where you are. God's calling you to build even in the exile you will excel but God told them you want to excel build number one if you want to excel in the exile build get to building get to working Don't just have a dream, work that dream. Don't just have a vision, you got to work, you got to build to see that vision become a reality. Friend, if you don't work, if you don't believe in it, no one else will work it for you. No one else will believe in it for you. But if you'll wake up every morning and say, God, thank you for this dream. Thank you for this vision. Give me the strength to make this vision, to make this dream a reality, God will give you the strength to build. Never do you read about Noah finding or asking God, God, but how am I going to get all the supplies for, for the boat? When have you ever read that? When did you ever read Noah worrying about where the supplies were going to come from so that he could build a boat that God called him to build? Friend, where God leads, God provides. If God told you to do that thing, he will provide the supplies you need so that you could build. But you worry about having an attitude that makes you wake up and persevere to build. The Bible says that God told them, number one, build. And then he told them, plan to stay. If you want to put that in modern day English, God was telling them, commit. Oh, come on, it got real quiet up in here. Because we're living in a moment in time where now more than ever, people are the most uncommitted ever. One fight in their marriage, we're done. Divorce. I'm getting this. I'm, I'm done with this. One mistake that the child makes. My child is a mess up. My child is not going to get better. 
Now more than ever, we're seeing people, oh, the business didn't work out. It's never going to work out. No, God told them, don't just build, but be committed to what you're building. Wake up every morning and look at that thing. And even if it's not done yet, even if it doesn't look like you want it to look, you keep working at it. You keep building it. Why? Because you're committed. The Bible says, that when you commit it to the Lord, it will succeed. That's not what Alex says. That's not what Iglesia Cristiana Misericordia says. That's what the Bible says. That whatever you commit to the Lord, it will succeed. So build, build whatever it is God's calling you to build. Don't worry about where the supplies are going to come from because just like God supplied Noah, he's going to supply you. But also, you got to be committed. It took, it, it took Noah commitment to keep, to keep working on that boat when people were looking at him and saying, bro, that guy's crazy. That guy is insane. First of all, where is he going to use that big of a boat? On what body of water is this man going to use that boat? And while Noah heard all that, you never hear about Noah needing more encouragement from God or Noah needing a community of believers to come and give him a pat on the back and say, bro, you got this. You keep at it. Hold on to the word of God. No, Noah kept building because he was committed. If God told me to do it, I'm going to do it. If God instructed me to do it, I'm going to follow through with it. Friend, it's not just about building. It's about committing. When you don't see the fruit from it in five years, will you give up on it? When you don't see fruit from it in three years, in two months, in ten years, will you stay committed to doing it? The Bible says that whatever is committed to the Lord, it, it, it doesn't say it might succeed. Maybe if the Sunday is good, it'll work. Maybe if the pastor preaches what you like, it'll succeed. No, it says whatever you commit to the Lord will succeed. You build that marriage and commit it to the Lord. Lord, what man, what, what God has brought together, let no man separate. You have those kids, build those kids and commit them to the Lord. God, these are your children. They're a gift from you. Use them, protect them, bless them. You build that vision and committed to the Lord. Lord, this is the business that you gave me. Cause it to flourish. Whatever you commit to the Lord will succeed. You want to excel in the exile? Build and commit. And then it says, number three, plant. Oh, I love that. Friend, if I could ask you something today, where are you planted? Where are you planted? Because yes, we talk about great seed, seed like the word of God, but I'm reminded of Jesus and the parable he gave his disciples saying that the word of God is like seed being scattered and there's ground that produces, but there's also ground that will choke up the plant and cause it to never produce. Friend, where are you planted? The Bible says that those who are planted in the house of God will flourish in the courts of our God. Friend, where are you planted? Are you more planted in, in your regret than you are in the goodness of God? Friend, are you more planted in the past than you are in the present? Friend, are you maybe even more planted in the future than you are in the present? Friend, maybe are you planted in, in, into some addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or some sort of pornography. But friend, where are you planted? 
Because the Bible says if you plant yourself in the house of God, you will flourish in the courts of our God. Friend, I came to tell you today, by you being here this Sunday, you asked God and you moved heaven to move on your life because you're planted in the house of God. And I came to tell you, if you will give God your life and say, God, I'm going to be planted in your house until I see you or until you come again, then I believe you will flourish all the days of your life. But friend, where are you planted? Where are you planted today? Because it matters where you're planted. You could be planted in ground that it doesn't matter how great the seed is. Because you're planted in the wrong ground, the weeds, the Bible say, will choke it and kill it. Huh. That sounds a, a lot of time like people's lives. They have great seed, great words from God, a great dream, a great vision. But because they're planted in the wrong place, the world overcomes it and chokes it and kills it. Friend, I came to tell you today, God wants to breathe new life in your dream. God wants you to excel in the exile. God wants you to prosper in the storm. God wants you to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. God wants you to live under the open windows of heaven that even though the economy isn't doing great, you will still flourish because you build, because you are committed, because you're planted. And because you'll flourish in the house of our God. Come on, can someone give God praise for, for that today? Four things. Four things that you need to do to excel in the exile. Number one, build. Number two, be committed. Number three, plant yourself in the house of God. And then the last thing that God told them was build homes plan to stay, plant gardens, and eat. Oh, I love that. Because the Bible says that though his anger lasts just but a moment, his favor lasts a lifetime. And we will see and we will taste of the goodness of God. Friend, I'm not just here to make you feel good with, with preaching or with screaming. I'm here to declare the reality of the word. You won't just build. You won't just be committed. You won't just plant yourself in the house of God, but you'll eat of the fruit you produce. You'll taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, I love that verse because tasting and seeing, those are only objectives done from a firsthand point of view. You only taste it. You only see it. I don't know about you, but have you ever been told by somebody, go to this restaurant and eat this? And you're kind of like on the fence about it because you're like, bro, your taste buds are not my taste, are not my taste buds. The Bible do doesn't say that you'll taste of what the pastor preaches or your taste of what the pastor lives. No, you yourself will taste and see that the Lord is good. You'll see it firsthand. You'll excel in the exile. You'll make it through the storm. You'll make it through the valley. The sickness won't stop you. The sickness won't kill you. The report won't stop you. You will excel in the exile. Why? Because, yeah, the Bible says that his anger lasts but a moment. That's why the people of God were exiled, because they had disobeyed God. But the Bible says that though his anger lasts but a moment, his favor lasts a lifetime. 
Oh, I came to tell you today, God wants to give you lifetime favor. Lifetime favor in your marriage. Lifetime favor with your children. Lifetime favor with that business that you would taste and see that the Lord is good because you're a child of God. Because you're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field. Because you belong to him. Because you're called by him. You will excel in the exile.